welcome back. We move on now then to point 8 in your notes, ownership of copyright. Now section 11 of the Copyright Designs and Patents Act relates to ownership of copyright. Perhaps not surprisingly, the author of work will normally be its first owner, but there are some exceptions. An employee who has created a literary, dramatic, musical or artistic work or film and created the work in the course of his employment does not have ownership of his creation. In that situation, the owner will be the employer. Unless the employer and the employee have a prior agreement to the contrary, and that agreement may be implied by past practices. Here you can, you can see, for example, the case of Noah and Schuber, a 1991 case that is, is on your case list. Now, Noah and Schuber concern an epidemiologist who is employed by Public Health Laboratory Service, and we're going to call them PHLS for short. He wrote a guide to skin piercing whilst he was employed by PHLS, but he did it in the evenings and weekends, and he placed a copyright notice on the work. Now, during an action for alleged infringement of copyright against the director of a beauty products company, the first issue was whether the plaintiff owned the copyright. So here we have a company coming along, along using his work. He sues for copyright and they say, quite rightly, in the very first best defence is, well, you can't sue us because you don't own the copyright. Now it was held that he was entitled to retain the copyright in the work as the long-standing practice of PHLS was that copyright was retained by the authors of works and that term therefore was implied into his contract. Also, if the employee's name is on the work or on copies of it, there's a presumption that it was not made in the course of his employment, and that's in section 104, subsection 2 of the CDPA. Difficulties arise, though, when the employee has a widely drafted contract which encompasses research, especially if the work he produces is useful to his employer. So, the case I'd like you to look at is Stevenson, Jordan and Harrison and MacDonald, which is a 1952 case. Here the employee was an accountant and he'd given some lectures and he later used his notes, his lecture notes, in a book. Now his employee had given secretarial help in typing and so on, but he was employed as an accountant to advise clients not to give lectures and therefore he was held to own the copyright in the lectures. Other parts of the book were based on reports that were written for clients of his employer and therefore the employer owned those parts, so we have a strange situation where we have a book that is partly owned by the employee and partly owned by the employer. You could ask then, who owns the copyright in these lecture notes that I use when I'm talking to you? I've written them especially for the lecture and I'm paid by the university to deliver a lecture. Well, this problem was addressed by our good friend Lord Denning um, in the case that I've just referred to. And he came to the conclusion that the lecturer is paid to deliver a lecture orally, just to speak it to you and therefore any notes that he makes are for his own convenience and not really part of his work. Therefore I own the copyright in these notes and I can deal with them as I like. And the same goes of course for the lecture notes that I give you in the booklets, either that you've downloaded or the booklets that you can go along and collect from the business school. Another area where there is potential for conflict is where work is commissioned. Although these difficulties can be overcome if you provide for this eventuality within the initial contract. So the person commissioning the work may not unreasonably think that he owns the work. But this is not the case unless um, the creator of the work is his employee, uh, employer. Uh, sorry, the, the creator of the work is the employee of the person who's commissioning it. Let's get it the right way around. Now the courts have used creative solutions in such cases, for example they would imply a license into the contract or use equitable principles to infer beneficial ownership. And I'll give you an example of that. So the case that I'd like to look at is Warner and Gestetner Limited, which is on your list, where an artist was engaged by Gestetner, and I'm sure you know what they make, photocopies, to uh, draw pictures of cats. <laughs> cats, what have cats got to do with photocopies? Well, Gestetner we're at a trade fair, so you have businesses coming around looking to see which buy, uh, photocopy they want to buy. So the artist was engaged without a contract, you know, he was just rang up, would you like to draw some cats for our trade fair to put on our stand? So he drew the pictures and they were stuck all the way around the stand at the trade fair. Um, they then, after the trade fair, they took the pictures down, they kept them 
and they used them in their advertising literature. And the artist said, well, this was outside the scope of the agreement that they had. This Justice Whitford in this case implied a term of beneficial ownership of the copyright to Gestetna. So the drawings then had two owners, one at law and one at equity. Another case which deals with a very similar issue in this area was Blair and Osborne and Tompkins. Again, that's on your list. Here we have an architect who is commissioned to draw building plans, the object being to get planning permission to build some houses. The site was sold, which is a plot of land, was sold and along with it the plans were sold. So you sell a piece of land with planning permission and the plans and it's worth a great deal of money. Now the new owner didn't like the plans 100% so he took them along to surveyors and asked them to modify it, which they did, and they then put their names on the plans, which is where the difficulties arose. The houses were built, the architect obviously recognised them, and he sued for infringement of copyright. Now, it was held that the architect owned the copyright in the plans, but as regards the building of the houses, it was held that there was an implied licence to use the plans for such a purpose, for that site only, and it extended to purchasers of the site. This was because, and this, this I don't think is unreasonable, the architect had received a fee for the work. He'd obviously been paid a great deal of money. If that term was not implied, that he would be able to charge again for the subsequent purchasers. So he'd be, that anyone who then bought the site, he'd be able to charge them more money without actually doing any more work, which doesn't actually seem very fair, does it? So I think, in fact, this was a good decision. Moving on then, works that are produced by Crown officers or servants uh, of the Crown in the course of their duties are another exception. So ownership here resides with, wait for it, the Queen, as it does for Acts of Parliament and measures of the General Synod of the Church of England. First ownership of copyright in bills, that is proposals for legislation, belongs to whichever House of Parliament it was made under the direction of. And if work is created by joint authors, then the ownership will be joint, as in tenants in common, not as in joint tenants, and I'm sure you've done this in your first two years of study. This means that each of them owns separate rights, and they can assign them without permission from the other, unless they have an alternative agreement, of course. And here we'll take a break.